So we met at Women in Design in Tasmania, uh, or Women at Design Tasmania in 2018, the symposium in Launceston that Karina Clark organised. While you were speaking about your work, I could just uh, imagine your work um, as fitting what I was trying to develop at that time, an expanded definition of data. So the shells I saw as a kind of data collection process that recorded climate change. And in my mind's eye, I could see your work in dialogue with another work that I was researching at the time called The Data Catcher by the Interaction Research Studio at Goldsmiths College in London. So the data catcher is a handheld device that sends messages like text messages about statistics of neighbourhoods in London as people walk around those neighbourhoods. The device scrapes publicly available data concerning crime, health status and property prices and sends it to the data catcher. So while you're walking around the streets of London, you get statistics about what the neighbourhood is really like. It's a sort of surrealist cut up poem about the contradictions of contemporary urban environments. So your work and your collection of data about the environmental conditions of Tasmania, in my mind, started talking to the data catcher um, and they had a great conversation as I was thinking about, well, these works are so strongly connected, although they come from very, very different practices and traditions and are exhibited in very different contexts. But I wanted to connect the kind of art and craft practice that you're most known for with this digital data um, cut up poem device that um, was being developed in London. So here's my question. So how do you see the shell necklaces and the other natural materials from Tasmania that you use in your work in relation to the challenges of our time? And there's two particular challenges that I see is most closely linked, climate change and also the recognition of First Nations people's right to autonomy. Yeah, look, it's um, obviously it's been a thought that, that, you know, we've been considering for years when we go from here back to Flinders to collect our mariner shells, we're always very careful about, first of all, we, we have to really plan our trip. So we, we look at the, the, the calendar for the 12 months calendar for the year to see when the low tides are. And they usually during autumn are the best times of the year from, right. from March um, and April are, are better times for us usually. Um, so we look at that time, so we do our bookings and then the other thing is that we look at how much that tide's going to be out. So it needs to be less than 0.5 for sure or, or half that again. Um, so that's the first lot of data that gets collected for us and, and weather conditions. Um, then we do all our bookings, our airfares for the, for the dates, the exact dates, you know, so we land there and we hit the ground running uh, with the low tides because those low tides only last for about a, for four or five days. And we go and collect in the morning with the low tide because the tide's only, when it's out, it's just around our ankles really. Um, so you can do it for probably um, two or two and a half hours, three hours at the most if you could. Yeah. Um, so then we come back to where we're staying and we freeze them because we're on the island. We have to freeze them uh, because we've collected them live and that's that's our tradition. We were allowed to collect them that way and trying to keep, um, I mean, the, the weather and all of that has a lot of influence and depending which way the weather is when we're there as to where we can go. I mean, we have about half a dozen spots we can go to. Right. Um, and of course, you know, we, we look at those spots every time we go to see if it's, it's been affected by the environment, whether it's affected by the climate or um, any of the changes from the global warming, of course. Yeah. And um, we also don't stay in the same spot and fish it out. That's another really important thing that would also ruin those collecting beds. We consider that we've got other family or other women coming behind us that need to collect. Nice. Um, so that influences the few days of collecting. I, I usually go, because I'm not very good at bending and walking anymore. So I take my son and <clears throat> grandchildren with me, um, which is what we did on our trip in March. And uh, 
and then we go back to where we stay and have our lunch and we'll head up the other end of the island um, to where the dry shells are because, you know, the tide's in by then. And um, But up the other end of the island where there's, there's a beach um, not far from the museum, we go and collect some dry, uh, we call them white cockles, but I think in other states they call them pippies. Right. Yeah, and um, there's one of those necklaces in that cultural jewels collection um, that you would have seen. Yeah. And um, so it is a really, you know, that's, we've got to abide by the natural sciences of the weather. Yeah. Um, and a lot of that is, uh, affects how we go because, you know, if we get over there and it's blowing a gale of wind, but we often can find a little cove somewhere to go in for, for a short time to make our trip worthwhile. And um, as I said, we don't stay long. This last trip we did, we went there on a Wednesday and then one of Rex's cousins came over on the Sunday. So where we'd been, she was able to go behind us and collect some shells because okay. she lives in Hobart. So it gives you an idea of how the shells are collected. And we keep an eye on, um, you know, what the shells are doing. And, and that's where it's influenced uh, my son a little bit uh, um, on the changes, yeah. you know, especially where the boat slip is, has been one of the affected areas. And in another place where the fresh water has run into the sea, that it seems to have burnt the tips uh, of the shells in that area. And we think that's from the, probably from the tannin, from the fresh water. Right. Um, so that, that's been, you know, we, we keep an observation e e each trip we go on. And we won't collect the really tiny ones because they need to stay there and grow and breed yeah. um, for the year because the, the mariners grow on a 12-month cycle. They go out in the deep water in October, November, apparently, um, to breed in 30 fathoms of water and then come in closer to uh, in the early in the year. Um, and I believe that when our families were, were mutton birding, the, the women would collect during that time and they'd exchange the shells with one another. Um, you know, they would collect on different islands too, but different islands have different shells also. So, and that's what we found out about collecting. If we want some, we've collected some mariner shells here, um, but very limited. Yeah. To, like a limited spot. It doesn't seem to have, uh, well, over there, we've probably got about half a dozen areas we can go to. That's not to say that it's absolutely flourishing. Yeah. Um, we have to keep an eye on that in the next few years because there's more women now making. Yeah. Um, so we don't want it over collected. I mean, if you look at some of the really old necklaces, some of those first mariner shells were quite big mariners. Right. And we've found that where they haven't been collected, there's, there's probably still some big mariners growing. Um, and we've worked with people and collected some king mariners. Uh, well, my son and my husband did on the northwest coast, and so we made a, I made a few pieces out of those. Oh, amazing. Mm. And they've been quite beautiful too. So they were popular. I think I made a, a new one with king mariners, and then green mariners around the back of the neck. Nice. And as soon as they've gone into the gallery, they've sold. So you could imagine what. Yeah, I imagine they're spectacular. Yeah. Um, there was a news report last night about tropical fish coming down from Queensland to yeah. Sydney and that they each they're hunting for kelp forest and they're eating their kelp and that, that's going to create all sorts of ongoing problems. Mm. So it's all up and down the coast, yeah. And one of the fish eats the mariner. It's called the parrot fish. Thank you for that. Uh, one of the other things, other aspects of your work, because you have a, um, a practice that is multi-pronged, for want of a better word. Um, when we've been talking last year and this year in particular, you've mentioned and we were trying to get you and Rex up to Brisbane to run a workshop um, of course, then the pandemic reared its ugly head again. Mm. We've had to delay all that. But the show is travelling to Adelaide next May. So, hey, maybe we can Brush do your it. Fingers. <laughs> um, 
Well, let's, I hope. Um, so that exhibition will be at Flinders University Art Museum. So I'm, I'm very interested in workshops and how working with people kind of makes the exhibitions come, as alive, come alive and how my own practice is more from, you know, sculpture and uh, painting into a kind of working with others to make images and to talk about difficult issues to do with data and technology and how we're adjusting to the rapid pace of change. So I talk about those workshops as breaching experiments where I get people to misuse technology to sort of see it as not something to be frightened of, but something that they have some agency in controlling and choices and decisions they make about how much technology they use. Um, some of these workshops are around sociological theory, around uh, how to disrupt the rules that we live by, the meanings that we attribute to everyday interactions socially. So I see them as a kind of form of serious play, which is a art history term <laughs> about aesthetics and what happens when people start working with materials in um, working with their hands while they're talking, the kinds of stuff that comes to the surface and the stories they tell are so rich. So we record all those stories. But your workshops, I think, are doing something um, a bit similar and a bit different. So your workshops, and the we haven't spoken about them a great deal, but they also sound like serious play. We get people to work with their hands and talk while you're making. And I think, you know, that kind of engages with serious play, which is properly defined as a playful inquiry that seeks to draw on the imagination to develop insight through effective association. So we feel our way through our stories by working with our hands. It kind of has a really powerful effect. So your stuff with the workshops is, uh, I mean, how would you frame your workshops in terms of what it is you're trying to teach and what it is that you get back from them? What, what I usually, um, I have to know what, sort of group it is, whether it's a conference group, yeah. uh, who it's connected to, or whether it's a young group. Obviously, if it's a really young group of kids, I, I don't use clips or thread. I let them thread it onto stretch elastic. So, you know, and I have, so I consider safety aspects of it too. Yeah. All, all of the most important things first are the tools that I use and, and what sort of uh, group of um, students or, or people um, that I'm working with as far as the equipment because I don't take the sharp tailors all into say kindergarten groups um, that's where I take the stretch elastic and have the shells already pierced with bigger holes for them mm -hmm. um, and the other thing I like to do is and I guess this is from my study I suppose is um, taking a, a group of slides to put myself in the picture in a way for them to understand, you know, where I come from. And uh, and I start off with using Truganini and Fanny Cochran Smith images and talk about how they made very long necklaces and, and wore their necklaces in several layers around their neck. Um, and some people, some women, even I can remember my mum saying she never felt dressed unless she had a necklace on. Oh. Uh, which was interesting, you know, from that, because when you think about the very earlier necklaces that were made by Fanny Cochran Smith and Truganini, they were part of their body adornment, so addressing their body. So rather than have scarifications, they, they would have worn these necklaces. And it also showed the status of those women yeah. in, in there. So, I mean, Truganini was a leader, you know, a leading warrior for her group of people and where she led those pe her people to and um, how she uh, collected her shells and made her necklaces. Um, I find some of the old images of Truganini in, in the libraries a question for me because the shells look like, they don't look like mariner shells and yet the mariner is, is our traditional shell. Yeah, right. the, uh, this is one of my very serious parts of the study is that those shells to me look like what we call stripy, well, Rex's mum called them stripy shells, I should say, uh -huh. and took them out into the schools, but they've now become renowned as the, the um, kelp shell, the silver banded kelp shell. So when I've cleaned them, 
they're almost beautiful silver color, a luminous shine that comes from them. Um, now, the Goma, um, they um, acquired two or three from me for the Asia Pacific Triennial. And I've always said that I must make one for myself, you know, as you, you do. But they, I fell in love with them by once they cleaned, they they completely different again. I've taken them out into workshops and the girls love them to put them on their bracelet. Um, so I always set the, the scene in a way that, you know, these are our earlier women that made yeah. them. Then I bring it through to showing them a photo of my mum cleaning shells and my mum threading shells with two or three of us when we had an Aboriginal woman down here from Queensland. Um, then I go into showing um, workshops or different, uh, a, a range of different patterns that I've made necklace out of. And then I've also then gone on further and said, well, I've gone, move sideways for that cultural jewels exhibition um, by using some of the, natural materials that we acquired as food. I mean, the, the casarina nuts, we um, used to pick them off the tree when we walked home from school. And, you know, the mussels is another shellfish, obviously. And I combined that with um, the gum nuts and gum trees. In very earlier times, Aboriginal people dug like a trench, a triangle trench, put warm rocks in there and then covered it with the eucalyptus leaves and sat in there and that cleared their sinuses or their colds or whatever. So that was yeah. as close to what we could get as being medicinal or food. Um, the other thing I made was a scallop piece, and but I threaded that on leather. And then the quills, of course, um, my yeah. mum and uncle called them porcupines, so, but they ate the meat. And yeah. there's a little quote in the book about that. Um, so yeah. I tried to use a range of... Uh, different materials that related to the food because I think I made those pieces for an exhibition that QB Mag curated about the Robinson Cup and we were meant to respond to it. So my response was whether it was today or whether it was back in those times, what would I do? And my rather than be negative, I thought I will turn a negative into a positive. So I would provide my people with food or clothes, something to wear. So I also stitched um, possum fur over um, some cane hoops. Um, so you could wear three of those around your neck at the one time. In fact, it'd be nice to make some more of them to for people to wear, um, you know, as a dress up parade or something, or yeah. something, something very special. And I made some armlets um, for the young boys thinking that they wear them uh, when they dance. So that's how the nine armlets got made, but the nine obviously represents the nine language groups in Tasmania. But this is a kind of serious play that you're talking about as well, because it's people engaging with materials and perhaps they could wear them as costumes and continue to you know, play their games or you know, their practices. It's fantastic. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, after, you might remember during the year when we were putting, started putting the um, final exhibition design together, um, I went through the photos that you'd sent me and I decided, sought to name each of the shells in the necklaces. <laughs> and then after I had done that, I then asked the gallery to send me the photos of the boxes, like to open up the boxes of the packages you sent last year before the pandemic struck or just as it was happening but before we knew what it meant. Um, and you had already written on the metal tags every shell in the necklace. So mm. it, I felt like an idiot, but it was a really good exercise. It was, like, oh, this, it was so interesting to like deep dive into what each of the necklaces is made of. So I, I, this is kind of curating at a distance in the pandemic, I guess. But in preparing for this interview, I thought, well, I'll go on next step. And I'm like, try and find um, the proper language terms for shells or those animals and came across the brilliant Tasmanian Aboriginal um, Centre map and their site which has a fabulous description around Palawakani and as you know which means Tasmanian Aborigines speak 
Um, but I can't find any names of the shells in um, Palawa, so I'm a bit stuck. Um, but I did, in, in that process, read the fantastic stuff on the Tasmanian Aboriginal Centre about language and the recording of language being so contentious because one term that really struck me as explaining the whole problem was um, the greeting, which was, yeah, sorry if I say this incorrectly. Yeah, palinga. Yeah, tawatya. Oh, okay. Is that whole thing that that's how it was recorded, but it didn't mean, hello, how are you? Of course, it meant, hello, I'm not feeling well. <laughs> um, so and it was a, a surgeon, a doctor who recorded that and among a bunch of other people. And so the, rec the records are all incorrect and proper research has to be done. But I cannot find the names of the shells. <laughs> no. Well, there's, there's no, that's, that almost could go on to another project. Um, see, we, what, and I've got it in this book. I've got some in this book. In the book, great, yes. Um, they, now they're common names, what we would call common names. Yep. Uh, for the shells, like the penguin shell, and then underneath they put the scientific name. I mean, to go on from this to the future would be giving them Palawakani names. Yes. Because this this publication has got Palawakani title. Yeah. Yeah. At the top of it. Um, and I deliberately did that because my granddaughter was asked to to speak at assembly at her school in Palawakani and she didn't know any of the words. So I thought I had to do something about it and doing something about it went with this book. That's fantastic. So common names like with the pink buttons and penguin shells and grey gold shells, brown gold shells, golden star shell, I think that's registered as that. Yeah. Banded kelp shell that we just talked about. Then um, there's brown buttons, orange buttons, toothies. <laughs> and I believe some of these names they got from what it reminded them of. Yeah. Um, and I found it interesting, you know, the gold shell is actually a bird and um, the black one is the black crow, which is, takes out another bird's name. Then the others are cereals. So, so oat shells, there's oat shell. Um, and, and there's cat's teeth. Yeah. And um, King, well, I think King Mariner. Uh, two lots of cat's teeth. And, well, there's five different species of mariner okay. in Tassie, which, well, we haven't found the Queen Mariner of recent, but, um, you know, there's a dog whelk shell. And uh, that white one I talked about is a white cockle. Yes. Um, and a lot of them, what I do, you see, I give them a kit with 60 shells in it and they have to tip them out and make a pattern. That's the first thing they do. Then thread their needle and decide what, and I always say to them, you can swap your shells, exchange with one another. Um, they don't get A grade shells. You can't, I can't afford that. <laughs> it would take me five years to get enough for workshops. Yeah, yeah. So, but I talk about the common names of, of the shells, uh, just so it's easy for them to identify if they go collecting and what they want to pick up and the button shell is really flat on one side, so I have to show them how to pierce them, you know, hold the shell sideways sort of thing. Um, I'd like to see the shells named with all Palawakani yeah. words in the future, so there you go.